Hello again and welcome back to the Pillar Channel. I'm Pablo, your host, and this is Kieran. Hi. <laughs> back again. <laughs> so we made a comparison between like other coding languages, I mean normal like run of yeah. software coding languages, yeah. and specifically blockchain yeah. languages, specifically Solidity yeah. language used to yeah. create smart contracts and whatnot yeah. for the Ethereum platform. Uh, can I call it a platform? Um, you can do, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and one thing that you mentioned is that um, the Solidity uh, coding language is a very strong or uh, strongly, strong, typed. strongly typed. I love that. Yeah. You, can't say, you can just say strong as well. Though. Oh, yeah. yeah strong language. Okay. Yeah. It's a very strong language. But you also mentioned that uh, JavaScript is a slightly more yeah. weak. It's a weaker language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but out of curiosity here, yeah. uh, what is the language used called Pillar? <laughs> JavaScript. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, so you've got some explaining to do. Yeah, for, so let me, let me explain this. I will explain this. Um, we use JavaScript for a reason, um, and that is because the JavaScript ecosystem is very large. It's probably one of the largest out there. What that means is that we there is a lot of software out there that's already been coded in JavaScript. Um, the community is very strong, meaning that if we need help and support, we've got it and we can find it quickly. Um, whereas if we decided to use a different programming language, I don't know, for example, you know, a more modern language like Golang or Dart, um, some of the software that we're looking for, the packages that we require, to run our software and to build our app might not yet be available. Mm. So what that results is in, we have to code that ourselves, but that costs development time. Right. So this is why we went... And that's very costly, this just is very so you know. Costly, very costly, and yeah. you know, developer time is costly in this day and age. Um, so this is why we chose to go with JavaScript, um, but in order to mitigate this whole idea of like you know weekly type programming languages, um, we do have several processes that run over the top of our programming language that mm. keep things in check. We keep the code clean. Um, we have automated processes that are constantly scanning our code for vulnerabilities. You know, low test coverage. Um, Prob potential problems down the line, you know, there's many different terminologies for, for this sort of like heuristical code scanning. Right. Um, but, you know, we're, we're well aware that we're, we're using a weekly type programming language, but we run our own strong processes on top of it. So, for example, you know, let's say somehow one of our developers does commit an error with, into the code and it enters our build pipeline. And our build pipeline moves the code along several processes. So, for example, like cleaning the code, you know, checking the code for errors, is there, uh, you know, enough test coverage? Every it moves it along every step, and one of these steps will catch the error in this code. Right. And what happens is the code stops there, and it doesn't even make it out the door. Oh, good. So goodness. that's that's how we mitigate this. And at the end of the day. You know, again, speaking about before how we're all human, we make mistakes. We do make mistakes. Right. Um, and with JavaScript, it's just not caught until a little bit later down the line. So that's why we run all these, you know, th these checking processes on top of our code um, all the time, just to make sure that we're not making errors that one would make with a loosely typed programming language. So before every commit, every new thing that you try to implement, every new line of code that's written. Yeah. There's automatic, like automated processes yeah. running on top of it to check if that's all right, yeah. but also people. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, even just as we're typing the code, you know, the, the first check is as we're typing the code, if we're doing the code wrong or it's, it's not very efficient, we get highlights straight away. And that's as we're typing the code. So much like when you're typing a Word document mm. and you spelled something wrong, it gets highlighted we have that same mechanism in place with the code. Awesome. So when, when we're typing code wrong, or we've used something in, in a wrong fashion or manner, mm. um, the code is highlighted, and we're pointed to the fact that, you know, this is redundant code, or it's erroneous in some mm -hmm. way. So that's, that's how that works. And that's just as we're typing the code. 
the moment we commit the code, there are further checks in place just to make sure everything's okay. The moment that the code is committed, it then enters, enters another several build phases um, just to run even deeper, harder checks on the code. And then once everything checks out, is checked by a human, just in case, um, or several humans, mm. a, a, as some of our um, software repositories require. Um, and then once that is all checks out, only then do we release it. And, right. e and even then, it doesn't even hit prime time straight away. It goes to a sandbox, what's known as a sandbox. Then it goes to a non-production account, so we can test it as if it was live. And then from there, it goes to our production account, which is what the users, our end users with the app, will interact with. That's awesome. So there's a lot, it goes through a lot of hoops just to get out of the door. Yeah, just so people know that uh, we take like those security and privacy things very seriously here. It's basically what Pillar is built on. Very much so. That's the pillar yeah. of Pillar. Yeah. If I may. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, I like it. So, yeah. So, um, that's an interesting question because like that brings me to a, a comment made in one of those one of our videos yeah. a few months ago and actually you helped me answer that uh, question because again I'm learning here just as maybe you are um, but I'm, I'm learning here and uh, a lot of the times to answer some of your questions on our comments down below uh, I go to Kieran or any other members of our uh, dev team, uh, and that question was how easy in these lines, how easy is it to break into my pillar wallet? Um, it's not, it's not, it's not easy at all. In okay. fact, I would say it's nearly impossible. All right, that's a statement. Yeah, it's, it's quite a statement, but you know, allow me to explain. Right. Um, so, really, when it comes to a crypto wallet, it all comes down to your private key. Right. You often see people talk about private keys, and at the end of the day, your private key, you know, your, your addresses, your, your smart wallet addresses or normal wallet addresses, your key-based wallet, are all derived from your private key. You also need your private key to make transactions as well. Okay. So not only to read transactions, but you need to make transactions. Mm -hmm. So imagine, you know, you've got one set of keys that will allow you to read, but if you want to read and write or write, you need the private key as well. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Which, which, so you need like two sets of keys. Okay. So, <clears throat> but this private key, we store it in an area of your device, your phone or your tablet, that's known as the H HSM, the Hardware Security Module. Okay. And nearly every phone has this sort of you know, feature or functionality. It's where all your passwords are also stored. Um, you know, any sensitive system data, anything like that, that generally personally identifies you in some way or form is stored there. But, you know, to crack, to crack this, you know, I can't, I can't really put it, put it any better than this, but you, you need government, government level resources. You need government level resources and government level finances in order to, to reverse engineer these dedicated hardware security chips, you know, that have been designed from the inside out with many hundreds of layers of security just to find the key in the middle. Right. So is it worth it? You know, even if you think it's worth it, it's going to take a lot. <laughs> right. We are right. talking, we are talking six, seven, eight figures to hire the team, you know, with the intelligence. It's above my pay grade. Yeah. <laughs> me and you both. Above my pay grade. Me and you both. And to be able to hire the intelligence and the team to even, to, to even start to begin removing the layers of these hardware security chips. So for example, like, you know, <clears throat> these days companies like Google and Apple take it so seriously that what was the, you know, hardware security module was generally built into, you know, um, their own processor on, on the device. Uh -huh. They are now their own microchips, and dedicated they, yeah, microchips yeah. on the board um, that, that deal with only security 
and the fact that they've offloaded that and separated it out of the processor and made it its own processor, you know, speaks volumes really into how seriously we're taking security in this day and age. So, right. for example, Google's security chip is known as like Titan, mm. and Apple's security chip is known as the T2. So these are just dedicated hardware chips, and to get to get into these chips, it's it's just it's astronomically hard. You know, it it's hard by design. Right. By design. So, right. That's awesome. Yeah. So, like, but it's not impossible. It's not impossible. Okay. I, I have to be I have to be real and say it's not impossible. But the chances of it happening are so, so, so small. You have to get in trouble. You've got to do something horrifically bad, really bad, and the government have to absolutely know what was on your phone for them to go to the, to the extent of hiring, you know, expert security teams, it would be it would be a hell of an operation that would cost many millions um, just to get into that chip. Wow! So I'm I'm not worried. One more thing then. Yeah. On still on this subject, um, you talked about the private key. Yes. Right. As in, we have a key-based wallet. Correct. Right. And how everything kind of like derives from that, yeah. and you need the private key in order to get inside yeah. the wallet and everything. But what about the smart wallet? So the smart wallet, we, cre we, we create the smart wallet from your private key. Right. So it is still derived from your private key. But the main difference I would say, you know, to put it very simply with a smart wallet, is that your, your smart wallet is backed by code. Okay. So n not only does it perform the basic wallet functions like you know send and receive transactions um, it also has lots of bells and whistles and extra functionality that let it do more than what a normal wallet would do mm. so for example like you know friend based recovery um, off chain transactions if possible um, just it just extends the functionality of your wallet so it, it, in a sense it doesn't necessarily makes it more secure it can do, okay. but it can do. It's a possibility if that is the the design of the smart wallet code. Okay. But you know, it's one of the things that it could do hmm. if it was designed to do it. And with the added benefit of like, uh, if I do something terrible, which I don't recommend. Uh, neither do I. I don't recommend you do anything bad. But like, if by any chance the FBI wants to get my wallet and says like, okay, I need to see inside of Pablo's wallet, because he's a dodgy, have you seen his mustache? <laughs> he's dodgy, I need to see I need to see his wallet, to see what's going on in there. And gets my wallet and I can just like, if I set up Pillar as one of my recovery agents, agents for example, yeah. just can call up Pillar and say, yo Pillar, my wallet has been stolen. Yeah. And then you say like, okay, sure. Then you recover it for me and then it's boom, I have my wallet again and the FBI yeah. has nothing. Yeah, it's, it's possible, yeah. Especially with a smart wallet, because again, like you know, we have the ability to write the code that allows a smart wallet to have these superpowers, if you could say. And one of the things that could be programmed is what exactly what you said. Right. So, in a sense, would you say that the smart wallet is a natural evolution? Uh, I would say, yeah, very much so. Mm. I, so, know, for just, just for the skepticals out there, because I, I've, 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 I've. Bumped into some skepticism yeah. uh, in the comments and as everything. <laughs> so, like, yeah, as yeah. we do. Uh, but everything is very new in this space. Yeah, it is. Right. It is. So and this is an evolution. Yeah. So um, we need to we need to be aware of that. Yeah. There will be skepticals. There will be excitement. Yeah. There will be everything yeah. in between. So yeah. This but I think that sums it up. Yeah. Sounds for good this, to me. For uh, this privacy conversation that we just had. Um, but thank you very much, Kieran. As for, always, my pleasure. For answering all the burning questions. No problem. All the burning questions that I had in the back of my head. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I believe that all, any question isn't like, no question is a dumb question because it can be your question. It can be your question and it can be your question as well. So, <laughs> so thank you very much for watching and uh, subscribe to the channel. Leave a like if you like this guy. And leave a comment if you have any questions regarding privacy. Bye.
line yeah, and we can do our best to answer it either in written form or video form. Sure? Cool? Awesome? Cool. Fine.